The next section is brief. We should be able to finish it today. It's also kind of a weird section in some ways. I always vaguely wonder if I should skip it, but then a few pieces of it are just such standard material that I feel like maybe I shouldn't. Um, let me start by saying that we can multiply matrices, but they don't have to be square, but for our purposes, let's say we can multiply square matrices is together if they're the same size. And I don't want to dwell on this. We're not going to be doing this by hand. So the details aren't really significant, but it takes, it takes about a minute to put the definition of matrix matrix multiplication on the board. So um, no need to leave it as a black box algorithm. You have a matrix A times a matrix B. I've said this before, but matrices are often kind of storage units for vectors because the columns of a matrix are vectors. So we can think of B as being a bunch of column vectors sitting next to each other. And A times B, the uh, first, I mean, A times B is a matrix, first of all. Its first column is going to be A times the first column of B. Its second column, is going to be A times the second column of B, and so on down the line. Its last column is going to be A times the last column of B. And again, I don't think we're ever going to do this by hand in this class. We just need to know conceptually that we can multiply matrices together. Um, related to that, you can sort of divide by some square matrices. And again, this is like probably a full day of lecture in in linear algebra that I'm going to try to distill into a five minute summary. Um, think about what multiplication, what division of real numbers is like. If you have three divided by two, you could think of this as multiplication. This is three times the fraction, one half. So we can always uh, um, sort of think of, of division in those terms. And the relationship 
dividing by two is the same as multiplying by one half, the relationship between these is that two and one half are multiplicative inverses. You multiply them together and you get one. So you would never write this, but I mean, you it's just not standard terminology. But if we wanted to divide one matrix by another, it makes sense to talk about as long as we can reef frame it in terms of multiplication, because we can multiply two vectors together. So now, we have this vector C, this matrix C, and this matrix, we won't write one divided by C. We'll use this notation, C with a negative one sign in its superscript. And just like just like with real numbers, um this C and this C with a negative one sign to the upper right must be multiplicative inverses. If we're going to think of division in terms of multiplication. And, um, We're not going to learn um, with real numbers, multiplicative inverses are the simplest thing in the world. You take a number, you put it in the denominator of a fraction, there's your multiplicative inverse. Five and one fifth, negative seven and negative one seventh, and so on. Um, for matrices, finding inverses is quite difficult. If it ever comes up, we're just going to do it on the calculator. Um, the definition has to be modified slightly. You can't multiply two matrices together and get the real number one. But... But we have this matrix that acts like one, the identity matrix. So C and C negative one are multiplicative inverses. If we multiply them together and we get the identity. Um, and I wrote those two equations. I don't think this is ever going to come up in differential equations, but matrix multiplication is not commutative. A times B and B times A are different quantities. So that's why I wrote this twice, C times C inverse and C inverse times C. Um, not all matrices have multiplicative inverses, but the ones um, we're going to look at in this class do, so we won't worry about that detail in this class. Let me get our calculator loaded. 
Well, it loads. I mean, not every real number has a multiplicative inverse. Zero doesn't. So it's not that surprising that not every matrix has a multiplicative inverse. But zero is the only real number without an inverse, whereas there are a bunch of matrices without inverses, including matrices that are never equal to zero in any of their components. Um, if we wanted to find a matrix, an inverse, remember that we can only find inverses of square matrices. So if we wanted, for example, the inverse of this sharing the screen, I can't remember. Let's be sure if we want to find the inverse of something like this, we would just do it on the calculator, which I mean is honestly true in linear algebra as well. We theoretically learn to find inverses, but it's such a messy process. You just go to the matrix menu, you select the matrix whose inverse you want. There's a dedicated inverse button. And by a freak chance, well, not a freak chance, it's because of the two by two matrix I modified, but the matrix I chose as an example, is one of those matrix that doesn't have an inverse. I'll bet basically anything I do to it, let's change that to five, let's change that to one. Now let's try that again. And here is our inverse. Uh, inverses tend not to look very nice. It might be a little less awful if we write these decimals as fractions, but there is no way that we can pretend this is a nice looking matrix, whether it's decimals or fractions. Anyway, this idea, um, well, that we can first, the idea that we can multiply matrices together, but later the inverse stuff gives rise to some thoughts. If we can multiply, we are looking at um, linear homogeneous systems of differential equations with constant coefficients, always a mouthful, uh, but when you write them out using math notation, it's a lot quicker. Um, we're looking at these equations, x prime equals ax, where x is a vector. A matrix A times a vector X, we learned how to do that multiplication. Now that we've, um, now that we've said we can multiply matrices together, it seems like it might sort of, um, raise new uh, possibilities. We could look at differential equations of the form x prime equals ax, where x is a square matrix instead of a vector. But in reality, um, 
these matrix differential equations are completely equivalent to the matrix vector differential equations. So that solving this and solving this are exactly the same thing. So we don't really get anything new from this. In particular, let's define a matrix. It's uh, the notation we'll use is the Greek letter phi. And as I said, we often will we'll define this matrix as a vector storage unit. So this matrix B we'll think of in terms of columns. It has columns X1, X2, up to Xn. What are these columns? Well, they're linearly independent solutions who this differential equation down here. And what's this B? Well, it's the solution to that matrix equation up there. So think how this works. Suppose that you've solved this somehow. If you've solved this, you found B. If you found B, the columns of B are linearly independent solutions to this. So you found N linearly independent solutions to this. So if you've solved the first equation, you've also solved the second equation. And vice versa, if you solve the second equation, if you found the general solution, I should say, well, to find the general solution, you need N linearly independent solutions. Take those solutions you found, put them into a matrix, and you have solved that system of that, not a system, you've solved that matrix differential equation. So solving one is the same as solving the other. This V, by the way, has a name, it's called the fundamental matrix of the differential equation. And the reason I'm, I'm always born when we get to this section, there's always a part of me that thinks, well, if, I mean, if, 
is there a point to even bringing this up? If it's going to turn out that solving these matrix equations is really just another way of thinking about these vector equations. But these matrix equations can be kind of useful when you have initial conditions. Initial conditions are something that we kind of stop thinking about at some point, or at least stop talking about. Um, remember that usually, in addition to having a differential equation or a system of differential equations, you'll be given some kind of data, and you'll want the system to satisfy that data. And we haven't talked about that yet. And one way to talk about initial conditions is to use these fundamental matrices. Suppose we have x prime equals a x. And suppose we have a general solution. A general solution, if a is n by n, a general solution is going to be x equals C1, X1, plus C2, X2, up to Cn, Xn. And remember, I mean, hopefully it sort of goes without saying by now, but even though I'm not using function notation, this X is a function of T and all of these X with subscripts are functions of T. They, they're like um, vectors of exponential functions and stuff. Um, so we said this earlier, um, I don't know if you haven't taken linear algebra, we might not have spent enough time on it for on it for it to really stick. But we said earlier that linear combinations of vectors can be thought of in terms of matrix vector products. This is the matrix that has columns x1, x2, up to xn, times the vector that stores c1, c2, up to cn. Well, in terms of what we In terms of what we had on the previous frame, this vector that stores the solutions, this matrix, sorry, that stores the solutions, is the fundamental matrix B. So at X equals phi times a C. Now let's see what happens if we take this same situation and we give initial conditions. And this only works if the initial conditions are all at the same value. 
let's say x over zero equals, and we know what all of these x's are at zero. And again, this isn't, I mean, you could have thus clean initial conditions. You could know what x1 of zero is and what x2 of three is and what x3 of negative seven is. And those initial conditions will make your solution unique but we won't be able to investigate them using the fundamental matrix. So we're making an assumption here that we know these X values at some number. And the zero, the zero doesn't matter. If, if you know what all of these values at five are, that works just as well. We'll just put, zero in for convenience. So we can solve that differential equation. We are, uh, I just sort of, I didn't make a song and dance of it. I just said, okay, we're done with this section. And then we moved on. But we have, um, if we find the eigenvalues of this, we have looked at all of the possible cases. We've looked at what happens if they're complex. We've looked at what happens if they're real. We've looked at what happens if they're complete. We've looked at what happens if they're defect. I mean, I guess there are a few kind of aberrant cases. What if you have a defective complex eigenvalue? That's the kind of thing that I never bother to memorize and just look it up if it happens. So we can solve x prime equals a x. But what do we do in terms of that initial value, in terms of that x of zero equals x zero? Well, there are, there are a few ways we could go about this, but we're going to go about it in terms of the fundamental matrix. So, I mean, we're practically, say we're going to go about it in these terms, but we're practically done. Um, we've got this, when we plug zero in here, x of zero equals, and now I'll use function notation to, for emphasis. B is a matrix of functions, but we're plugging zero into all of those functions. So now phi is just a matrix of numbers. And X of zero equals X sub zero. So that's right. X sub zero equals that. And now B is a square matrix. B has an inverse. It always does. Don't matter about the details. It's linear algebra stuff. But we can always divide both sides of this equation by phi of zero, which when you write it out is phi of zero inverse times the vector x sub zero 
equals C. So you can use this fundamental matrix to deal with, um, with initial conditions and to solve initial value problems. And um, leveling with you, this is not, if you're like using computer technology, this is probably not how you'd do it because finding inverses is kind of a long and difficult process. And it's something that we'd almost always rather avoid if we can avoid it. But I mean, with the matrices we're looking at in this class, like a two by two matrix or a three by three matrix, your calculator is going to be able to handle that. And we're not going to run into the kind of issue that arises in the larger real world problems. And that's fundamental matrices. And it seems like we should be done with this section, but there is one more sort of piece that's packed on at the end. I'm never never been totally sure why it should show up here. It's not related to fundamental matrices. 